Hello, everyone, one and all. Welcome to the first episode of the Flyered Up Podcast. I am your host, Amadeo Gracia. Along here with my co-host, would you like to introduce yourself? What's up, guys? Uh, my name is Chris Mayer. Very excited to start this podcast. Uh, let's get everything rolling. Indeed, let's get everything rolling. The Philadelphia Flyers. Very interesting team. Been a big stretch of mediocrity for the past few years. That Stanley Cup run they had in 2010, and basically just ever since then, nothing has worked out. Missing the playoffs, making the playoffs, that Ilya Brzezgalov contract that no one wants to remember. <laughs> uh, Andrew McDonald, we bought him out, thank God. But it's just, there hasn't been like that major excitement for Flyers hockey over the past few years. It's just been a ton of mediocrity with this team. Just just constantly missing and making the playoffs, missing the or getting kicked out of the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. There's just like, has it been that exciting moment in the past few years? And just, Chris, how long have you been dealing with this frustrating franchise? Um, I started watching hockey at probably the worst possible time, the 2012-2013 uh, lockout, uh, 48 games. East played East, West played West. It was really bad i mean at the time i knew nothing about contracts and standings and you know all that all that stuff so i was kind of just trying to enjoy you know watching the flyers and stuff like that back when they had chemo team and in my canoeball scott hartnell uh wayne simmons just so many older players but uh i think this team has a real good bright future and i'm really excited for it yeah like you said bright future ahead of them and with this whole debacle of the past season with firing GM Ron Hextall, firing head coach Dave Hextall, then hiring new GM currently right now, Chuck Fletcher, bringing Scott Gordon to be the interim head coach for the rest of the season. And now Chuck Fletcher during the offseason brings in an experienced head coach, a very well-known, well-respected coach in the NHL, Elaine Vigneault, has over 600 wins to his resume, just missing that Stanley Cup. But he does believe that the Philadelphia Flyers are very close to doing something. They're close to doing something special. And that's one of the main reasons why he accepted the job to be the head coach. And also Chuck Fletcher bringing in a, t- a lot of experienced assistant coaches along with Vigneault, bringing in Michelle Terrian, who was a, a tenured head coach at the Montreal Canadiens. Mike Yo, who is very familiar with Chuck Fletcher, worked with him under the Minnesota Wild organization. And then Mike Yo also was the head coach for a little bit with the St. Louis Blues. So you got a little bit of experience there in the head coaching staff. So that might bode well for this team just because we had the ex- inexperienced head college head coach with Dave Haxtall, and that experiment really didn't work out. We had Scott Gordon call- called up. There was a little success, but then it was just basically the same theme, inconsistency, mediocrity. There just wasn't that spark. And maybe this veteran coaching staff can possibly bring that spark to this team. And... Chuck Fletcher's main goal was to get this team back into being a contender. Just with all the young depth that we had, all the young prospects that Ron Hextall brought over from his tenure as a Flyers GM, Chuck Fletcher is trying to mesh that with veteran depth. There's something to help these young guys just, I wouldn't say develop, but learn the game better, get more experience and just be better from it. Guys like Ivan Provorov, Shane Goss Bear, Travis Sanheim, and young and up-and-coming guys like Phil Myers. These guys need veteran presence, veteran leadership to help guide them. Because we saw that how much our defense struggled last year after two years of Ivan Provorov, the first two years of his career. Really solid, but then last year was the first year he really struggled. Shane Goss Bear has been very inconsistent since his being called up. Travis Sandheim has only had like a year and a half of experience. And Phil Myers has barely scratched the surface of the NHL. So veteran depth, veteran leadership could possibly be the help for this team. And a couple of those guys that were brought in, the veteran leadership, guys like Matt Niskanen, we traded Radko Gudis to the Washington Capitals. We have acquired Matt Niskanen. And I would say that's an upgrade. Over Radko Gudis, I would say really anything's an upgrade over Radko Gudis, even though he was one of our best defenders last year, but that's to a stretch. But I believe Matt Niskanen can possibly be that better veteran presence to help guys like Proroff, Gossespierre, 
And Matt Niskanen does have a Stanley Cup to his resume. He won it a couple of years ago with the Washington Capitals. And yes, last year he had a bit of a down year, but you can really say the same thing for the entire Washington Capitals team, getting over that Stanley Cup hangover. And as the, as the year went along, the Capitals did get better. So maybe Matt Niskanen can bring that experience that he brought over from Washington and help these young guys out. And another trade that we made, we traded a second round pick in 2019. We traded a 2020 third round pick to the San Jose Sharks for Justin Braun. And San Jose Shark fans have nothing but compliments for Justin Braun. They hated to see him go. They hated that the reason he was traded. And they had nothing but compliments for him. He's a guy that can grind minutes. He can play in the top four and play the important minutes that you need. And he's been a very solid defender over his career. But then you get the argument where did the Flyers overpay for Justin Braun? And I do get the argument because it's two early draft picks, one in the second, one in the third. But I believe it's worth it to get a guy that can help this young defensive core. Niskanen having two years left on his contract. Braun does have one year left on his contract. But Chuck Fletcher made it his point to bring in these veterans to help the roster out. And Chris, what do you think of these two moves by Chuck Fletcher? I loved both moves. Um, I feel like, especially what you said, um, with bringing up veteran D-men, which is what they needed to do, especially because the defense struggled last year, what you said, um, bringing in Matt Niskanen, bringing in Justin Braun, both both guys average over 20 minutes of ice time, both real good penalty killers. They can move the puck out of their own zone. Uh, This is definitely something the Flyers have needed uh, for the past couple years, and I'm really excited to see what they do on the ice uh, in October. Yeah, just very excited to see what they can bring. Very excited on how they can help this young defensive core. And it's just, I think Flyers fans are maybe maybe underrating these trades a little bit because I can get the argument because they're restless because this team hasn't been very good for the past few years. But I would say just give this a chance because these guys haven't even touched the ice yet. So we really don't know what they're capable of. But I believe that it's good for the Flyers and it's good for this young defensive core. And on to another big move. This was be around the time of the Stanley Cup final before the draft. Chuck Fletcher traded a fifth round pick to the Winnipeg Jets for upcoming UFA Kevin Hayes. And this was the big move that Chuck Fletcher wanted to do. He is a bona fide second line center, something that the Flyers desperately needed because the center depth on this team has been lacking over the past few years. Now that you have Claude Giroux playing the wing permanently, you got Sean Couturier on that first-line center role. And Nolan Patrick, maybe possibly he could be the second-line center of the future, but right now he just hasn't shown that capability yet. And bringing in a guy like Kevin Hayes can possibly fill that role of the second-line center and give Patrick the consistent minutes on the third line. And like I said, Kevin Hayes was an up-and-coming UFA before the July 1st deadline. And the Flyers had a little bit of time to negotiate with Kevin Hayes before the the UFA market started to open. And in Flyers fashion, they wait till the very last minute. And they do <laughs> manage to sign Kevin Hayes to a seven-year contract with an annual value of $7.14 million a season. And right off the bat, people say this is a definite overpay. And yes, I do agree. This is a definite overpay for Kevin Hayes. But it's free agency, and you overpay for the players that you want to get. And yes, maybe would I have signed Kevin Hayes to maybe like six point six and a half, six mil? But you weren't going to get Kevin Hayes for that. He was demanding money, and that whole debacle with him not wanting to come to Philadelphia. He was only going to come here because if they overpaid them, and that's a load of crap. I don't believe that one bit. Kevin Hayes, he signed that contract. He signed with the Philadelphia Flyers. He wants to play here, and. Yes, it's an overpayment, but we have him for the next seven years, so we'll worry about the money later. And I think Kevin Hayes will be a good second-line center for this team. He's playing with Jake Voracek. He's playing with J- James Van Riemsdyk. And those guys are two better offensive threats than what he had possibly with the New York Rangers. And he was playing four flying third-line minutes with the Winnipeg Jets. So I think this opportunity for Kevin Hayes can work well for him. So, Chris, what do you think can work out with this Kevin Hayes trade and signing? Um. I definitely think it's going to help out uh, Nolan Patrick. One thing you said, um, he's going to be able to figure out his role. Um, he hasn't played to his potential 
of what he was drafted uh, in 2017. He is going to bring uh, a lot of veteran uh, aspects to the team as well, just like Niskanen and uh, Braun. Um, he's also really going to help out uh, Jake Voracek and uh, maybe Oscar Lindblom, maybe James Van Riemsdyk. Um, as we don't know who is going to play on that second line, uh, we're going to have to see what happens. But I definitely do think Hayes is going to help out on the penalty kill as well, as he is a really good penalty killer. A uh, real good 200-foot player. I'm real excited to see what he does as well. Yeah, definitely the penalty kill needs some work because we all know that last year's special teams was a major problem for the Philadelphia Flyers. <sighs> Man, it was bad. Yeah, being bottom 20 and at least throughout the entire season. Yes, the penalty kill did get better as the season went along, but you were still bottom 20 at least. So it's you're not going to make the playoffs when you have a below 20 ranked power play and a below 20 ranked penalty kill. You're just not going to make the playoffs. No and shot. That's why the, one of the main reasons the Flyers missed the playoffs last season, just terrible special teams. And with those, all these coaching changes, maybe the power play, the penalty kill, maybe they'll start to improve. But we'll have to see as the season starts. And little other small moves with the whole backup goalie situation. We have the, the reason if it was going to be either Brian Elliott coming back or Camp Talbot coming back, who we traded during the middle of the season for Anthony Stolarz with Edmonton. And there was really a whole debate who was going to be brought back. Cam Talbot, we all know he's really good friends with Carter Hart, trains with him in the offseason. So it kind of looked like it was going to be meshing well together. It was the perfect backup goalie, uh, goalie tandem with two buddies as the starter and the backup. But Chuck Fletcher decides to go with Brian Elliott, who's returning on a one-year contract worth $2 million. And honestly, I do believe that Brian Elliott, Elliott is the better option just because he's been a more consistent goaltender throughout his career in the league. And yes, he does have injury issues, especially with his tenure with the Flyers. And the guy just can't stay healthy, but I do believe he's a better option than Cam Talbot. And maybe the possibility that Carter Hart takes over the starting role and Elliott becomes the backup. We might see Elliott play less games. His body probably will be more healthy because of that. And we might see a fully, a fully maybe 100% Brian Elliott through an entire season. I'm not going to guarantee that because the guy can possibly step on the ice and break like glass, like Michael Neuverf. But not as bad as Michael Neuverf, but Brian Elliott can do the same thing. But I still believe he's the better option than Cam Talbot. So, Chris, do you believe that Chuck Fletcher made the right decision with the two goaltenders? 100%. Um, especially because... We, you, we didn't really see much of Cam Talbot last year, and I think one of the reasons because of that was because they didn't have anyone else. I mean, it was Carter Hart for a while, and they weren't going to play him as much because they were still trying to make the playoffs. And they were only a few points out at one point where they came back, had that eight-game win streak. Hart, Hart was playing phenomenal. They were all playing real good. Uh, and then they kind of f fell off the train a little bit there, but that was another reason why I didn't want uh, Talbot to come in. Um, I just feel like Elliott is the better guy. Uh, he was really, really good with St. Louis in his career. Uh, start, fell off a little bit with Calgary. Um, Elliott is definitely the best decision, and they got him for pretty cheap as well. Only a year or two million. I think it's good for a backup. And if Elliott is able to come in, play 25, 30, 35 games behind Carter Hart, I think he will be just fine. Yes, I agree with you completely. I do believe Elliott is the better option than Cam Talbot. Like you said, we haven't seen Talbot throughout the majority of the season. He only played like in a couple games, and those couple games really weren't that good. So, he only played four games. Yes, four games and the small sample size, even though he wasn't really that good. And the Flyers in general used eight goaltenders throughout that entire season, which is an NHL record. <laughs> so the Flyers in their whole can't find a goalie thing, and then they broke the record for most goalies used in a season. Ugh. That that was a nightmare with that, that whole goalie debacle. Oh, my goodness. A scary one. Yes, a, a very scary situation. So, into more brighter news of the offseason, we bring back a couple RFAs. We bring it back Travis Sanheim on a two-year contract worth 3.25 annually, and we bring back forward Scott Lawton on a two-year contract worth 2.3 annually. And I just Travis Sanheim hasn't really had like a year and a half in the league. But last year, he really blossomed on that top-line role with Ivan Provorov. He was probably one of the Flyers' better defensemen throughout the entire season. And I feel like 
there's only more room for improvement for Travis Sanheim. I feel like he's going to improve even more. And this contract right here, it's basically a bridge deal for Travis Sanheim. We'll still have his RFA status once this contract ends. And if Travis Sanheim can improve over these next two years with this contract, he'll probably expect a bigger payday. And going with Scott Lawton, he has been a very versatile guy for us, playing on four or five minutes, playing third line minutes for us. He's one of one of the better bottom six guys that we have in a lineup. And he had a really one of his best seasons as a flyer last year, offensively wise, defensively wise. He's a really good 200 foot player. He can provide that offensive game when you need it, play the penalty kill. I just think Scott Lawn is the perfect bottom six guy role. He could play the third line, he could play the fourth line. And I feel like this contract for Scott Lawn, it's a good contract for him. It's a good contract for the Flyers. And I feel like Scott Lawn and the Flyers will only benefit from this because, like I said, he's probably one of the per- perfect bottom six guys you could have on a team. And Chris, just what do you think of the bridge deal for Sanheim and what do you think of the Lawton contract? Like, what do you think this is going to do with these two players? I definitely like uh, the Sanheim bridge deal because, as you said, it's going to bring more time for Sanheim to blossom. Um, he's going to be getting those. I'm sure his ice time is definitely going to go up this year. He had a really good offensive year last year. Uh, if he's able to continue what he did um, last year with uh, as many points as he put up, um, I think Sanheim is going to be getting the big bucks in uh, these next two years. And as for Scott Lawton, I honestly do think that Lawton is, uh, as you said, a one of our better um, bottom six players. Uh, he's real solid on the penalty kill. Uh, he uh, he can play. He also can play wing as well. Uh, there's an argument where he could play on that third line wing this year, or third right wing, excuse me. Um, so I'm not really sure um, what they're going to do with that. But I de- I love both contracts, especially because they're low on money. Uh, both players deserve the money they got, and I'm real excited to see what happens. Yes, yeah, very excited for these two players, and just like a couple of small things that happened. Uh, Ryan Hartman that we got last season from Nashville. Uh, He was traded to the Dallas Stars for Tyler Pitlick, and Ryan Hartman was an RFA, and it looked like Chuck Fledger didn't want to pay Ryan Hartman what he wanted, apparently. So we flip him to the Dallas Stars for Tyler Pitlick, who has one mil on his contract, so that's a very cheap deal for the Flyers. And the Dallas Stars, they don't sign Ryan Hartman at all. They They just release him. So... Kind of the Flyers win in that deal, I guess. I just don't, that don't trade remember. also did save 1.5 million in cap space, which was another reason why I liked it because now they have Konechny and Provorov to sign before camp. Oh boy, that whole situation! But this, it's just this trade still, just like, just what did Hartman want that the Flyers traded he wanted, him? I think in, he wanted around 2.5, and there was no way he was going to get that. 2.5. No, the man does not deserve two points for a guy whatsoever. Who, what did he put up? He put up what, like almost forty points in his rookie year. He hasn't didn't really do Done much. It. Yeah. Since I mean, he was solid on Chicago. I mean, didn't do real really didn't do much in Nashville. I didn't see much of besides maybe the first game he played here in Philly against Buffalo, where he laid out Rasmus Dahlin. Um, but besides that, I really didn't see much from Hartman. Uh, I don't think he did really did much. And I'm kind of happy that uh, they did let him go because he was kind of just going to be a waste of a roster spot, to be honest. Yeah, yeah basically. And besides that, like, first game appearance where he had that big hit against one of the Buffalo players, he really uh, yeah. hasn't done anything ever since. Mm-hmm. So I I like the trade for Tyler Pitlick. He's a guy that can possibly play on the fourth line. And, but, you know, Flyers lock. Tyler Pitlick does get injured in the offseason. He gets surgery. But he is expected to be back before the preseason ends, which is a good sign for the Flyers. So it's nothing too drastic. So the Flyers will expect him back by the end of preseason. He's possibly going to be a guy that fills in on that fourth line role, possibly with Scott Law and, and Michael Raffle. So, yeah, just an interesting offseason for the Philadelphia Flyers, bringing a lot of new faces, re-signing some old ones, some young guys. And just like I said, Chuck Fletcher wants to build this team to get into contention. They want to be that team that contends for the Stanley Cup year after year and bring in those head coaches. And I think Chuck Fletcher has a goal set in mind and I think he's starting to achieve what he wants. It just, we have to see how the product responds on the ice. And so now we get past the off season. We're starting to get into the rookie camp training camp area. Training camp starts this weekend. Rookie camp started a couple days ago. And 
The rookie game is actually tomorrow. Today we're recording this on Tuesday night before the rookie game. The rookie game is on September 11th in Lehigh Valley where the Phantoms play the PPL Center. And a lot of surprise, a lot of interesting names on this roster. A lot of exciting names. Guys like Morgan Frost, Joel Faraby, Isaac Ratcliffe, German Rubstoff. Just a lot of top prospects playing in this rookie game. And just like over the course of rookie camp, we see all the drills with Joel Faraby, Isaac Ratcliffe, Morgan Frost on the same line together. It just looks very exciting. It's just, Chris, like, what do you think? Like going through this rookie game, what going through rookie camp, like who do you think is going to be the more standout player? I, I, if anyone, I would have to see Morgan Frost. I mean, the, that line in rookie camp was phenomenal. They were, it was a really good line. They gelled well together. Um, I, it's a real exciting group. I'm really excited for the rookie game. Um, I definitely think it's either going to be Frost or Farabee. I could maybe see Ratcliffe. I mean, there's there's a lot of guys that I think could make this roster. Um, but if I had to say number one, I would pr- most likely say Morgan Frost. But uh, I would not leave out uh, Joel Farabee either because I think he's also made a real good statement too to make this team. And just like what you said for Joel Farabee, and honestly, in my opinion, I think Joel Farabee is the more NHL-ready player. Yeah. And like this kind of compares to the situation with the the recent first two draft picks of this past year's draft with uh, Jack Hughes and Capo Caco. I think Jack Hughes has the higher ceiling, but Caco is the more NHL-ready player. He's played in a professional league over in Europe, so I think he's more prepared for the NHL. Jack mm-hmm. Hughes, like I said, I think he's going to be a really good player. He has the higher ceiling to hit than Caco. And I feel like that's the same thing with Morgan Frost and Joel Farabee. I think Joel Farabee is the right now is the more NHL caliber player. Morgan Frost has the higher ceiling to hit. And just the the skill that both of these two possessed, I think the Flyers have really two good prospects under their hands right now. And even a guy like Isaac Ratcliffe, he scored 50 goal 50 plus goals with the Gulf Storm last year in the juniors and he led led his team to his conference championship. They went to the Memorial Cup and I feel like some people are little undermining on Isaac Radcliffe. I feel like he could be a good guy that can possibly come up here, be a net front presence, be a guy that can get the puck in the net because he scored 50 plus goals. And I also believe that there's also an underlying prospect and that's German Rupstoff. He played a couple, didn't play the whole season last year with Lehigh Valley because he got injured and missed the most of the season. And, but from his small sample size in the AHL, he has speed to his game. He plays a 200 foot game. And I feel like that can bode well in the NHL because we all know that the NHL is a speed game right now. It's a speed and skill game. And I think what German Rupstop brings to the table, he could possibly maybe sneak a roster spot with no one expecting that. So like, like we, we discuss like Chris, you're probably more standout guy. Who do you think is the more, I would say underrated guy, maybe the underdog, if you would say, uh, I mean, there's a few names. Um, I would say, um, let me think here. Uh, we could say Rubsov. You could say Matthew Strom, Maxim Shusko, Mikhail Vyorbiev, Pascal LaBerge. Uh, there's a lot of guys. Connor Booneman. Uh, I'm real excited for, the, for the, uh, the Phantoms this year. I'm also real excited for the rookie game, see what these guys can do. But if I had to go with one of them, um, I would definitely say Rubsov, and if I had a second pick, I would say Strom or Shushko. Yeah, Strom's also an interesting decision. Strom, with all the Strom brothers that are in the NHL right now, Dylan and Ryan, we all know Dylan has played a lot better since being on the Chicago Blackhawks. Ryan, the NHL really hasn't fared much for him, and with the Flyers drafting Strom a couple of years ago in that fourth, fourth to fifth round, and the kid has skill. The kid can get the points. It's just his problem is the skating. And That's he really the has... only thing I am worried about about him is yeah. skating. Yeah, it's the one thing he has to work on. And... He has the body. He has the skill. He's got the potential. He's got everything. I just think it's the skating that I'm worried about. The only yeah, thing. That's his major flaw, and he has to work on that. So I can maybe – I wouldn't see Strom, like, surprising anyone, but he's definitely going to be, like, a top-role guy in the AHL because – He's one of our young prospects. He's one of our better prospects. And I think he's going to get that better chance in the AHL to develop his game more and maybe work on that damn skating. Right. Ugh. 
So, going into the rookie game, like all these main prospects that we've been talking about, the Farabees, the Frost, the Radcliffs, featuring that game, we also have goaltending prospects, Felix Sandstrom and Ustamenko being the goaltending duo for that game, and Sandstrom after the Carter Hart th- Carter Hart being our Lord and Savior. Sandstrom is our next best goaltending prospect. And it looks like he might start in the AHL with Alex Lyon. So who do you think, Chris, that with this Sandstrom, the Ustamenko, like who do you think can possibly battle it out for the AHL? Because we all know maybe one of those goalies is probably going to bounce and go to the ECHL and Reading to play as a starter, possibly down there. Um, I honestly, I mean, they're both amazing goaltenders. Uh, they both had real good seasons last year. Uh, but if, as you said, I would have to pick Sandstrom. Uh, Sandstrom looked really good uh, last year at camp. He looked, or, uh, excuse me, well, this summer. Uh, he looked real good at camp. Uh, the year before that, he looked good as well. Um, but if there was one guy, I'd have to, it would definitely be Sandstrom. Uh, I think Ustamenko is, uh, he's close. But I th- as I said, like he's a really good goalie as well. But I would definitely say Sandstrom. Yes, I, I believe that Sandstrom is probably the better prospect right now for the goaltenders, but right now it's the Carter Hart show, and Carter Hart being what he did last year, being our lord and savior Carter Hart, and we all know he's going to be the starting role for the Philadelphia Flyers. Look, seeing guys like Felix Sandstrom, Ustamenko make it into the AHL, the ECHL, it still bolts very well because Ron Hextall, when he was our GM, he drafted a lot of good goaltending prospects. He also drafted a lot of just good prospects in general. And it's kind of exciting to see these young up-and-coming prospects just come into the death pool and just play for us. So it's going to be a very exciting rookie game tomorrow. It's going to be 7 o'clock. I think the the Phantoms feed that we're getting in Philadelphia, it's going to be on NBC, NBC, NBC Philadelphia Plus, and we're going to get the feed over from Allentown. So it's going to be a very exciting game tomorrow with the rookies. And just once that rookie game is over, the main focus is going to be going towards training camp when all the when all the veterans come to camp when all the like the rookies will also play as well and it's gonna be a very exciting training camp to see guys who fill out spots with the roster so Chris like who do you think is going to stand out in the veteran training camp when it comes around this weekend um there are a total of 63 players that are going to be uh in this year's training camp uh, I think guys that are going to stand out, um, some of the new guys, uh, Kevin Hayes, Matt Niskanen, Justin Braun. Uh, then you have, you know, your your vets, Drew, Couturier, Voracek, Van Riemsdyk, uh, Lawton, Limblom, Patrick, Konechny, Raffle. Um, if there's one guy I think that would stand out, I would definitely say Kevin Hayes. Uh, I would say Hayes, uh, obviously your starters. Um, but I think another guy that I think is going to have a real good camp, I'm going to say Phil Myers. I think he's going to have a real good camp, and I think he's really going to uh, make a name for himself so that he can crack that spot on this roster. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And Phil Myers this season, he switched his number to the single-digit number 5, replacing Samuel Moran's number 5. I think Moran is now number 55, so I think with Phil Myers getting that single-digit number, I think he's maybe... I wouldn't say be a lock for the roster, but I think Chuck Fletcher, he wants Phil Myers to have a more important role with this team being on that bottom six pairing with yeah. possibly a guy like Shane Goss to spare. Mm-hmm. So I think Phil Myers is going to impress in camp. Like you said, Kevin Hayes is going to impress in camp. But I think the more important spot that we really need to focus on, because we know the first line, we know Sean Gatore, we know Claude Giroux is going to be on that first line, Travis Konechny as well. The second line, we all know Jake Voracek, JVR, Kevin Hayes is going to, Round up the top six. But the more important thing is, is going to be that third line. We have Nolan Patrick. We got Oscar Lindblom. But who's going to be on the wing beside them? So maybe that could be a spot where a guy like Morgan Frost, like Joel Farabee, Isaac Ratcliffe can step in and steal that spot and make the, make the roster at a training camp. So it's going to be very fun to see right there. And then you got the fourth line. It's most likely going to be a guy with Scott Wallen. It's going to be Michael Roffel. And then you'll possibly see a Tyler Pitlick there as well. But who knows? We might see another young guy who can possibly steal that spot as well because we all know Tyler Pitlick is going to be missing that preseason until the very end. So maybe his spot can be stolen off of the roster by a young guy that earns the roster spot even more. So 
Like, who do you believe that can possibly steal that third that third wing spot? And who can possibly steal that spot on the fourth line if Pitlick spot gets taken? Um, I would most likely say Frost or Farabee. Uh, but the, the thing is, is I don't know if they would play on the third line. Uh, I know you can argue this, but do you think there's any chance that Scott Lawton could play on that third line right wing? And then you could maybe throw in uh, a center uh, like Frost or like Farabee, someone who could play center, uh, put them in on the fourth line with guys like Michael Roffel, um, maybe Chris Stewart if he makes the team. I mean, you never know. Uh, really, I mean, I think we're going to know closer to the season, and I think we're going to have to wait until after camp, but my guess, I'm gonna have to say, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say Joel Faraby. Interesting choice. I do agree with you. I do think Joel Faraby is the more likely chance to make the roster at a training camp. And I do like the points that you bring up with Scott Lawton possibly being slid up into that third line wing role. But I think Chuck Fletcher is, is opening the spot. He is opening the spot for a young guy to possibly step in and take that role because Chuck. There was all these like news going around is chuck fletcher going to fill in that third line wing spot with possibly going out and getting a trade going out and getting a free agent but chuck fletcher stood his ground he didn't go after anyone he made all those other moves with the defense he signed brian elliott signed those young guys sanheim signed lawton he didn't really go out and get like those free agents that were on the market to possibly fill in that third line role so i believe he's more giving this a chance to young guys like frost Faraby, and ratcliffe to possibly steal a spot so I think once training camp ends, you're going to see one of those three guys, I think, more on the side of Frost and Fairby making that third-line spot. And I just feel like Scott Lawton, even though he would be a guy that could possibly fit on that third line when needed to, I feel like he fits the role better playing with Michael Raffle on the fourth line just because he, I feel like he works better more as a grinder type of guy. He could play the 200-foot game and then sometimes bring in that offensive offensive production when you need to. So I feel like Scott Lawton just playing with guys like Nolan Patrick and Oscar Lindblom, who are more on the offensive side and more skilled-wise, I don't think Scott Lawton might not mesh well with those two. So I think bringing in a young guy that has skill like Morgan Frost and Joel Farabee might bode well better on a line with Patrick and Lindblom. So I think having Scott Lawton on that fourth line being a grinder with Michael Roffel, I think that'll work better for the team as it moves along forward. And just as the preseason is also starting to come closer as well. Training camp starts this weekend. The first preseason game will be Monday at home against the New York Islanders. So it's going to be very exciting too. We get the fans get the chance to see the brand new scoreboard that was put up in the Wells Fargo center. That thing is absolutely gorgeous. Oh Beautiful. Beautiful. That thing is something spectacular. Oh, it's a I love how it curves in the middle and everything. It's got the, the piece at the top that like moves up and down. Oh, it looks so nice. Yeah, it's it's something to be amazed of. It's a 4K scoreboard. It's probably the most advanced scoreboard in the NHL. It does all these fancy things. It moves. It expands. It all that stuff. Oh my God, I just love it. Uh, I can't Beautiful. wait. See, I can't wait to see that on Monday when I'm at the oh. game. That's gonna be something amazing. And also something interesting too. The Flyers they actually decided to go with a single logo on center ice, so that they're the they were the last NHL team to have two separate logos on center ice. So now they join the whole pack. Now every team has one single logo at center ice. So Flyers right there breaking the tradition of the Ed Snyder tradition of having those two, the old fashioned style things going on in the Wells Fargo Center. And just the all the renovations going on in the Wells Fargo Center. That's gonna be something something fun to see. You have the whole new clubs opening up. There's actually gonna be sports betting going along in the Wells Fargo Center. It's gonna be an interesting year team wise and also just with the new updates to the Wells Fargo Center. All those updates are definitely not going to be ready by the time preseason starts, but they're definitely going to be ready by the time the actual regular season starts. So it's going to be a fun year. So what are you looking forward to most, like just going to the Wells Fargo Center? What do you want to see besides the scoreboard, actually? Um, I'm kind of looking forward to those black seats. I mean, I know it sounds weird, but like if you look at the way Wells Fargo used to be, those those red seats, they they were so nice. Like when you when you would see the game on TV, like those the seats would pop out. But honestly, like you know how like you know home opener or playoff game, they put they put like the shirts on the seats and stuff. I feel like it never really gelled well with the red. So I mean, you never know what it's gonna look like with the black. 
I mean, I liked how the black was uh, last year, where where they had it in the uh, up in the two hundreds. Um, I did like that, and now it's all throughout the stadium. And another thing is that I'm looking forward to. I'm gonna definitely be looking forward to the new center ice logo, um, as you did mention. Um, I feel like it looks sharp, even though I kind of missed the the two logo, and I thought that was really cool. And now you could see it from both sides, wherever you sat. Uh, it looked real nice. But um, I think the I think that logo does look sharp, and I think the only year they had a full logo besides that was the 50th anniversary, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the that was the first time the Flyers went with one full centerized logo. And I think every team that year, so the '67 expansion, Kings, Penguins, Blues, uh, and so on, they all I think they all had the main one big logo in center ice. I don't think they had like a because at the time the only team that was. Um, that had the double logo was the Flyers and Montreal yeah. at yeah. that time. Yeah, so the Montreal finally decided to switch to the single logo and the Flyers yeah. were the last remaining team. So mm-hmm. the Flyers and decided to I feel like Montreal's looked real nice this year too in some games I'd watch. I think I think it was it looked real sharp as well. Yeah. I don't think I don't think I'm gonna get the full justice until I see everything in person because I can't really you know what I mean? Like I wanna yeah. make sure I see everything there. You know, I didn't even know the scoreboard was curved until I saw those videos today about it. So I was like, oh, my gosh, that's another thing I get to look at. It's going to be yeah, great. You can't judge everything by photos and pictures and videos, but I right. feel yeah, the best possible experience is to go see that in person. So, hey, people, go buy your tickets for the preseason games just to go experience that whole new setup with the Wells Fargo Center. It's going to be something fun to watch. And before we get into our next little discussion right here, we're going to pause for a couple seconds to hear a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm one of the hosts of Massive Late Fee. Do you remember Blockbuster? Well, we do, and we racked up a lot of late fees there. That's why we're glad there's things like Netflix, Hulu, and Blockbuster has died, mostly because of us. We cover streaming shows and pretty much whatever we want. Join us every Thursday as we talk TV and movies on Massive Late Fee. You can find us at Massive Late Fee on Twitter, Massive Late Fee on Facebook, you can email the show at massivelatefee at gmail.com, and you can find us at MySpace, Massive Late Fee. Massive Late Fee, the best podcast we can think of. And welcome back to the Fired Up Podcast with Amadeo Gracia and Chris Mayer. And our next topic we want to get into, it's very important with this Philadelphia Flyers team, the two big RFAs, Travis Connecting and Ivan Provorov, they are not signed yet. And what the hell is waiting? What the hell are they waiting for? Just... <sighs> Why? I I don't know. Uh, so yesterday, uh, Zach Wierenski got signed to a three-year, $15 million deal. Uh, AAV, $5 million. Um, Provorov and Charlie McAvoy, the two defensemen that have been waiting for uh, one of the other of the three to sign. Uh, Wierenski signing first. Um, so now I'm hearing that Provorov doesn't want that contract. Yes, I remember hearing from Flyers reporter Sam Carcitti. He was talking about uh, the possibility for that three-year deal for Provorov is there, but I think Chuck Fletcher and the Flyers and Provorov and his agent are maybe possibly looking towards and possibly like the three-, four-year deal, the five-, six-year deal. So we really don't know what's going to happen with Ivan Provorov, but Chuck Fletcher has stated that his main goal until veteran camp opens up is going to be getting Travis Konechny and Ivan Provorov signed. So... Maybe this Wierenski deal can be like the starting base for a negotiation with Provorov. And it's funny too, like me and you were talking about this before and when the Wierenski deal first happened, we thought like, whoa, why is he getting paid this much over three years? But then we realized it's only 15 mil in total. We thought <laughs> I it was thought like... it was a three-year, $45 million, 15 yeah. million AAV. I was like, wait a second. I was yeah, like, like, there's we don't even have enough cap space to sign Provorov to that. And I'm, I was in school and I was like, oh my God. And I yeah, got out and I saw it on my phone. It's at five million. I was like, "Oh wow!" I was like, yeah, "Wow!" Yeah, like that's like the one thing sometimes I get confused with when people post like contract stuff. Yeah. I always get confused with because when they'll always put like the year first, then they'll put the amount. Sometimes I keep forgetting that the amount they put next to the years is the total value instead yeah, of the that's annual what value. I thought too. So I just like thought, "Whoa! Why is he getting paid this much money <laughs> for three seasons?" Right. He's not. He's not worth Connor McDavid money. No. He's not worth more than that. That's more than Connor McDavid money. Jesus, I I don't want to think about that yet. That's two and a half. That's uh yeah, two and a half million over Connor McDavid money. Oh, that is goodness. crazy. 
That is crazy. Zach Rowinski. And behind yeah, he... that, Panarin. And, and another thing is that is with the way people wanted to say about Kevin Hayes like being overpaid, I know this is kind of like an older topic, but I wanted to bring this up because there were a lot of guys that got overpaid this year. I mean, you look at Matt Duchesne, Anders Lee. You got Panarin, who you can argue 11.5. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, may You could maybe argue uh, Jeff Skinner, Tyler Myers. Um, let's see, who else? Skinner. Yeah, I said Skinner. Uh, oh, Jacob Truba, that's another one. Who got eight years, like, what was that, eight years, seven million? I think so. Yeah, I think 50, it, was like a, it was like a 56 uh, annual, or not annual, uh, like in full. And then which you, is... you also had some of the other guys who probably thought you were going to get more money on the market. Guys like Jake Gardner, who signed with the Carolina Hurricanes. He signed for four years. He signed very cheap with the Carolina Hurricanes. At four guys, million. Yeah. Guys like Wayne Simmons gets a one-year, like, prove-it deal with the New Jersey Devils. Mm-hmm. And some guys that you probably would expect to make more money aren't as because you got this whole deal with the RFA market, all these RFAs holding out. It's just like been a tough process this free agency. This has probably been one of the more crazier free agencies mm-hmm. in a while, specifically with the RFA class. And just going back to this Travis Connecting and Ivan Provorov topic, they're one of those two they're two of those RFAs that are just haven't have been holding out there waiting for their deal to be processed. And it's just like a common theme with RFAs in recent years. They just don't want to go for that long-term deal. And I'm not saying like sign Travis Kennedy and Ivan Prover up to these long-term expensive deals because they're not worth that money yet. But it seems like players don't want to be locked up for that long because they feel like they want to control their own destiny. Like with a guy like Austin Matthews from what he signed, he signed for five, six year deal, but he's getting paid 11 mil per season. And when his contract runs out, he's going to be a free agent. So he gets to control his own destiny. So I feel like that's the more mindset of the RFAs. Make more money in shorter term, and then you could possibly get into free agency earlier in your age. And it's just, it's a very stressful process, but I don't blame these guys for wanting to get paid. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can understand um, the way they want to be paid and stuff like that. Like, GMs, they love bridge deals. Players hate them, and it's because they just don't think they deserve that little money. Uh, for only being in the league for a few years. Um, I mean, it worked out well with the Flyers, the way they did it with Sandheim, the way they did it with Lawton. Um, and I feel like if they can do it with Konechny around three years, maybe four, uh, 3.5, maybe 4.5, or you can maybe do it with Provorov too, maybe three, four, maybe five, maybe do around 5.5, 6. Uh, I feel like that's perfect for both of them. Um, I feel like both of them should both, they should both get bridge deals, um, which is seems like a common thing that Fletcher has been doing uh, besides Kevin Hayes. Um, he's done it with Sanheim and Lawton. So um, we're going to have to see what happens. And I definitely do think that these guys can be signed before camp. If they do it right, they can be. this can be done by Friday. Yeah, and that's Chuck Fletcher's main goal, to get these two guys signed. Right. And just like when you were talking about like contract ideas for these two players, right. I've been like when I've been thinking to myself, like thinking about Travis connecting, what can this guy possibly sign for? I think the perfect value for Travis connecting right now, given what Sean Couturier is making, given maybe not what Shane Gossesberg is making, given what Couturier is making that 4.3 per season. I right. think that is the perfect amount for Travis. And that is an underpaid for Couturier. With Definitely. the way he's played these last two. Oh, my that is that is wow. Yeah, expect that pay raise when he gets into free agency in three if years. If you think how, uh, like, if you look at Connecting last year, he, Connecting he had a good year. I mean, he was real. He had forty eight points last year. Uh, he could crack fifty. Um, but the thing is, is if you like, how many times do you think Connecting hit the post last year? A lot. A lot. <laughs> exactly. And if you put and say all those are goals, that's 40 goals right there. It's, I mean, like, that's that's crazy. I mean, Jeff Skinner got 40 goals, 23 assists, got eight years, 9 million, 17 million. And majority of his goals were in the first half. And right. he went with cold Buffalo with the rest really of the good. damn team. And right. he went cold with the rest of the damn team. Right. And he's making 9 mil per season. Crazy. Ugh. 
Crazy, that crazy. Very crazy. And just like, just imagine, like, remember how much, how snake bitten Travis Konecti was in the beginning of the season where he was just hitting all those posts? Oh my gosh. It's like, I felt like the dude couldn't get out of it. And then also with him being flip flopped constantly throughout the lineup, not getting a consistent role. And he still manages to put up that goal total, that point he total. Definitely does play good with uh, Konecti, or uh, sorry, uh, Drew and Couturier. He plays really good with them. But one thing that I want Konecti to get better is his defensive game. I feel like he just throws the puck into a random area, and then it's a turnover. I f- I noticed that a lot last year. I don't know if you have, but I did notice that a lot last year with Konecti. I feel like if he just picks his head up for another second or two, looks up, either dumps it, makes a pass, whatever, just make sure you get out of the zone because turnovers were not – uh, a good thing for the Flyers last year, and it was another reason why they struggled. Yeah, and I do like have realized that Travis Konechny yet yeah, isn't the best defensive forward out there, and yes, he does make a lot of turnovers. Yeah, and not many wingers are very good defensively. Yes, it's it's more centers and your defensive defenseman, but majority of it, really, who controls that defensive zone? That's the center, yes. because they they have. All the slot, which is the prime scoring area of every zone, and between the hash marks and from outside the circles. I mean, and and, the, and it's crazy how the way that they're able to do it, like, so fast, too. I, I, I just find it amazing how they do it like that. Yeah, it's just, why do you think Sean Couture is in that role on top line and center? Because he is the best defensive 200-foot right. forward on our team. Right. He's always been very good defensively. Yes. They dra- he was drafted as a goal scorer. He didn't go up. He he kind of struggled to score a little bit of goals. He put up like around 30 points in his first year. Not bad. He had around, had around like 13 goals. And he was kind of around the same. He was consistent throughout that. And played on the third line with Matt Reed uh, for a majority of his career. And then, you know, since the 17-18 season hit, he came, went up, went played on the f- second line, first line, Drew. Uh, they finally moved Drew to wing, which I thought was – an amazing choice, um, especially because he had 102 points in his first year at wing, 85 last year. Uh, I just think that the, if Katuri, if it took Couturier that long to develop, like into an offensive player, uh, like like he was in juniors, do you think Nolan Patrick is going to take the same road? Nolan Patrick, I think skill wise, he has the potential to become a better offensive player. I feel like Nolan Patrick just needs consistent times because right. last year, the same thing with connecting. He's been thrown up and down the lineup. He right. was put on the first line for a little bit, second line, mm-hmm. third line. There just right. wasn't a consistent spot for Nolan Patrick. And another thing is, was his line mates were always different. Yes. He played the one year. He had like Dale Weiss and Jordan Wheel. Last year, he had Lim Blom, Scott Law, and he had a bunch of different guys last year. There were so many guys that, uh, Patrick played with, and it, it, and if it's like that in the NHL, you, you just can't get used to them. It's not like it's you know like pickup hockey, something like that. It's you, you. I mean, you're on a line, you stay with them. Another reason why Lindblom and Voracek played so well, they were on a line for a majority of the year. Van Riemsdyk played well. Uh, towards the uh, end of the year, they had Van Riemsdyk with Giroux and Couturier. They they all played well. I feel like uh, Giroux also uh, plays well with Van Riemsdyk. Well, one because they had experience beforehand. And two, because they're both really skilled wingers, and they're able to do, they're able to move the puck. They know where they know where each other are are, are at all times. I mean, both of them, uh, I'd say, uh, Couturier and Van Riemsdyk, they both have a nose for the net. Same thing with um, uh, Patrick connecting. I mean, all of them do. I feel like another guy who had a good year last year was Oscar Limblom, put up 17 goals last year. A really good offensive year. Yeah, and I feel like the more the, – the guy that Nolan Patrick played with the most and I feel like he has the most chemistry with is Oscar Limblom. Right. I just – 100% hope, agree. And hopefully if the lines bowled out this year and the, both of those two play on the third line, maybe you'll see better production from both players. And even though Limblom did sort of break out with playing with Jake Voracek, I feel like those two playing consistently together, it'll probably help both of them out. Definitely. And yeah. think of going to Sean Couturier. Like how you said he was consistent through getting those like 30 to 40 something point totals, being on the third line, being on the fourth line. It's just, was Sean Couture always, did he always have that potential? Or did he, when he finally got the chance, he broke out? 
like not no that like actually let me rephrase that. Did he oh be, was he just being held back playing on the third and fourth line, and then he was finally able to show what, showcase what he can do when playing with Claude Giroux on that first line. Mm, I think Sean Couturier. Point. I think Sean Couturier always had that ability. He just never had the chance to show it because he, also he wasn't never playing. had the line mates either. Yeah, the line mates. Are Same the, thing with why uh, Vin, Vinny Lecav. Eh, Vin, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Vinny Lecavier uh, in the thirteen fourteen season. He struggled because he was on the fourth. He was a fourth line winger. He's a second line center. You play him with uh, Braden Shen, Scott Hartnell, Wayne Simmons. You know whoever you want to throw him with. Claude Giroux, maybe Couturier, Matt Reed. I mean, he's gonna put up points. I mean, for a guy like Lecavier to barely do anything while he was here, with the team they had at the time, it was a solid team. It wasn't great, but it, it was a solid team. It, it had it had a it's offensive squirts. Um, but I definitely do think if Patrick gets played with the right people and he's on the right line, which I think is the third line, because having Hayes there is also going to have a lot of depth at that second line center. And I also think it's going to help out uh, Voracek as well to have a, a bounce back here. But if Patrick is going to have the same line mates for most of the year, uh, if injuries can prevail that, but if Patrick has the same guys, the same line, chemistry, he should be just fine. And I think oh, he's going to have a breakout year. I could maybe see 60, 55 points this year for Patrick. Yeah, it's a possibility if he gets consistent line time. And right. also, I want to bring up like a thought you mentioned earlier. When talking about Claude Drew being put to the wing mm-hmm. and being that the best possible decision ever. And we saw how Claude Drew struggled the past few seasons at center scoring mm-hmm. the, the 50 below points, below 70 points. It's just putting Sean Couturier at center gives him that responsibility to be the two-way guy to p- produce offensively and produce defensively because Sean Couturier is a two-way guy. He's a selkie kind of player. Right. Claude Drew, he, yes, he can play defensively, but the guy is skilled. The guy is more offensively based. And being played on the wing, he doesn't have to focus on his defensive responsibilities as much as, say, playing at the center role would be. Because playing at center, you have to play 200 foot. You got to play both in the offensive zone, and you got to play in the more important areas in the defensive zone. So that's probably why Claude Drew struggled a lot playing that 200 foot game as he got older, mm-hmm. because he was playing the better matchups. And now right. playing on the wing, he has that chance to open up the ice more and get more offense. Hence why he scored 102 points. His 85 first last year. And 85 last year. Hence why. And his points another off thing is, is one thing that. I do think that Couturier has also really did good, really uh, did really good with um, on that first line was the faceoffs because Drew is definitely our number one center, a hundred percent. Even though he does play wing, he's amazing at faceoffs, uh, and he can take them in the power play, uh, you know, anytime you need him to. But I feel like Couturier really did step up these last two years with doing good with those faceoffs. Uh, another, and also the defensive draws, Scott Lawton, really good at defensive draws, Nolan Patrick. I mean, we had, I mean, we are like what I, I I mean, I would say like a top five, maybe top 10 face off team in the league. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I think last season we were like top five, top three in face offs in the league. At one point we were first in face offs. And it's surprising too, like being that high in the face off win percentage. Right. I think the team would be better because you're getting more of the puck control. Right. right, no, Flyers fashion. They because are and good. and the reason why I like the Niskanen and Braun is because you win the faceoffs. You have defensemen that can move it out of your zone. That's you what have... gets more of the offensive time, which is why yeah. they gave up so many goals first last year because they weren't able to move it out of their zone. Yes, yeah, it was turnovers, guys... penalty kills, everything. They were just bad. Yeah, now you don't have guys like. Robert Hay getting more of the ice time. You don't have Andrew McDonald getting ice time. Gudis. Even though yeah. Gudis, ha- I mean, I lo- I liked Gudis. Ever since they had him, I liked him. I've always respected him as a player, really? but that 17-18 season, he was woeful. But this year, I think last year, he had a really solid year. Uh, he stepped up. He didn't have as many penalties. He didn't take those stupid penalties. Um, he definitely did play good. Uh, he played real. I think he did play well with uh, Sanheim for a majority of the year too. I think they both gelled well together, especially because 
Gudis is more of a defensive defenseman on our team. He, you, you, you really didn't see much of uh, Gudis's offense uh, with us, uh, especially because I kind of wish he shot more when he was with the fire. I mean, do you, do you notice how good of a shot Gudis has? Yeah. And you never see it. Never. Yeah, because I don't he know just... if that's like a coaching thing, telling him not to take as many shots, but... Yeah, when Gouda's had the chance to take the shots, they were electric. Well, hence mm-hmm. when he scored in center ice that one and, time. Oh, oh yeah, against Columbus. Yep. And a lot of those uh, reasons why I like when Gouda's is out there is because they have guys that have the nose for the net, and they get there, they deflect pucks. And if you have guys that can deflect pucks well, hence Wayne Simmons, hence Kevin Hayes, guys that are able to get in there and – tip those pucks in with those shots that you're able to tip. I mean, because the game is now transforming from it was, it used to be the big slap shot with Zdeno Chara, Johnny Boychuk, guys like them who had the real big shot. Now it's that steady wrister that's getting on net. Guys like Provorov walking the line, getting the wrister off Sanheim, uh, Myers, Gostisbehere. I mean, they're it. The game is really transferred from that big booming slap shot to that walk in the line kind of wrister. And I think it's good because they're now going to have guys that are going to get to the net. You're going to have guys that are be looking for rebounds. And if you're able to get cycle it back to the point, I mean, they're going to have a lot of good chances this year where they're going to be able to move the puck in and out of the zone. And I feel like it's really going to, we're really going to see an improvement, especially in the defensive zone uh, with moving it and things like that. Yeah. Just like you said, I think, like what the NHL is transitioning to into defensemen that are fast, that have offensive production and can right. jump up into the play. That's mm-hmm. what a lot of the NHL teams they're transitioning into. You see guys like Zach Korwinski, you see Charlie McAvoy, you see Seth Jones, you John see Carlson, even, John Carlson. You see guys like PK Subban as well, doing all this stuff, Drew Dowdy and right. just guys that can drive the offense. They can get up into the play and guys that could be a major offensive threat as right. well defensively on the defensive side. It's just, that's what the league is transitioning into. It's a faster game. And and when I mean fast, I don't mean just by skates. I mean by, if you realize how much it takes you to wind up and take a slap shot compared to walking the line and shooting a wrist shot, it's a complete difference. Everything has went from, from slower to 10 times faster and I can't even imagine how fast it's going to be in in a couple years. Okay. And it's, and another thing is is I think the goalie um you know like reflexes reflexes rebound stuff like that. I think that's really improved too. Oh, definitely. I mean if you see the way guys have now with all the the big pads they got and I mean Ben Bishop for example, what is he 65 at least. Yeah, and he's huge. And just look at the way he played last season. He right. was one of one top three goaltenders against average. Top three goaltenders in the league, and he didn't win the Vesna. Right. I feel like Ben Bishop got snubbed for that Vesna trophy. Oh yeah, definitely. That was Without Vasilevsky who won that, right? Yes, Vasilevsky yeah. won that Vesna trophy. That wasn't. Yeah, there was no question about when that. When he when he did miss a good chunk of the season too. Right. But Louis Domingue didn't hold his ground for them. That was yeah, one yeah. of the reasons why they were. A good team because they had the back that they had everything that year. I don't know how they didn't go far in that playoffs. Crazy playoffs, crazy. Okay. Yeah, just just crazy. Four wild card teams making it past the first round. All the division winners not making it past the first round. Just an insane playoffs last season. Columbus sweeping Tampa, oh, Carolina God. making it to the conference finals. Oh, the, the Islanders sweeping Pittsburgh. Oh my God. Uh, oh my. So. I want to bring up some uh, some NHL news. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, talk about Patrick Laine. There's been a few teams. Um, the Flyers have been one of them that have been uh, in the rumors. Uh, there's also been Justin Falk's trade rumors uh, with him going to Anaheim, but he wants to sign a contract extension first uh, before that all that happens. And some NHL news today, Pavel Zaka signed a three-year, $2.25 million contract uh, with the New Jersey Devils, a 6.75 uh, annual. So uh, what are your thoughts on all that? I think on the Justin Falk news, I think I understand what he's dealing with right now. He has that no trade clause. He's going into the final year of his contract. And I don't blame him for wanting an extension before getting traded because just like 
if he gets traded without getting a contract extension, he has to move move him himself move and his family move out to where he ever he's being trained to, most likely right. going to be the Anaheim Ducks. Which is moves completely th- on the other side of, of the country. The country, right. Yeah, he moves out there, he doesn't get a contract extension, and he's a free agent. And then he signs with another team, say like he signs in the in the Central Coast, and he has to move once again. I don't think he wants to go through all of that. He wants right. a contract set in stone before he possibly gets traded, which I most likely think is going to happen right. in the next coming few days. And going to the Patrick Line thing, and just the RF, the biggest news just with the NHL in general is just this entire RFA class. I know. Not signing and holding Crazy. out. Mitch Crazy. Marner, Braden Point, Kyle Connor, Patrick Line, got Ivan Proveroff and Konechny holding out. Um, Charlie McAvoy. Charlie McAvoy. Zach Rinsky was one of the RFAs who budged. And there's a guy that possibly would have been on this list, but is not now because Mark Bergevin and the Montreal Canadiens decided to offer sheet him to force Carolina to sign him. Sebastian Ajo. He would have been on this list if it wasn't for Montreal budging into that whole nonsense. I feel like that was smart by them, too. It was. Because with the way they did it, it gave them time to figure out what they were, what they wanted to do, if they were going to sign them. Uh, things, I mean, it was, it's been a crazy RFA class. Uh, and another thing that uh, these RFAs are waiting out for is I don't understand why Marner is taking so long because now he just turned down a seven year, $11 million contract. I think the main problem with the RFA class right now, I don't think it's the problem with the money. I think it's the problem with the term. Exactly. I agree. Because they're the young guys, they don't want to commit long term to a team. Yeah. I think that they want the to game, go as I said, the game is too fast for them to be. Yeah. Like, I think they want to go around the three, four year deal, the bridge type deal. Well not the bridge type deals, like the three, four year deals that can get them to at least the last year of their RFA status or even to when they become an unrestricted free agent. I think these guys want to be able to control their own destiny and I think they just don't want to commit to a team long term knowing the future down the line. Because, like, say if Mitch Marner signs a longer-term deal with the Toronto Maple Leafs, Austin Matthews, his contract runs out in, I think, four or five years. What if he leaves that team and he and Mitch Marner is stuck on the Toronto Maple Leafs for, like, another three or four years? Right. Like, is it, hey, Austin got to leave, why can't I? So right. he wants... I think these guys want the shorter-term deals, but with more money. Mm-hmm. And the same thing goes for a guy like Patrick Laine, a guy that lit up the NHL his first two years. And even last season, he was really good in the first half. He just went very quiet in the second half. Six goals in the last 41 games of the year. Yes. And all these trade rumors that are surfacing up with Patrick Laine, just like, and you said the Flyers were brought up in those trade rumors as well. Yeah. Just imagine if that were true. Imagine if the Flyers got Patrick Laine. That is their goal scorer. And just... The points that he had last year, he would have been fourth on the team. He would have been top five in points. Right. He would have been second in goals Yeah, on a down year. Mm-hmm. Just imagine when he's on a good year. He could possibly, I wouldn't say go near Ovechkin totals in goals like 60 or something like that, but he could possibly yeah. reach 50. Maybe 40, he, 45. Yeah. Patrick Laine is the potential to become a 40 plus 50 goal scorer. And he has yet to do that, but he has the potential to do that. And I think... Like, I understand Winnipeg is in this really tough situation with the cap right now. They have two RFAs that are holding out right now. Kyle Connor is one of them as well. And just, like, imagine if Winnipeg can't get these two signed. That's at least 36, that's at least 60 goals off the books right there. Right. And and they were a lot another of, team that struggled last yeah. year as well. Just imagine if a lot of these RFAs hold out for any longer. Imagine how many teams are going to get screwed over because of this. And we we could be one of them. We could be one of them. We could be one of them. But just like going to the Patrick Laine trade, if the Flyers were to say trade for Patrick Laine, who would you trade them? That's a little fun topic right there. That is a very fun topic. Um, I saw a mock trade. It was Provorov and Konechny for Laine. I was like, and it was a poll on Instagram, and it was 100% no was every answer. (laughs) 100% 100% no. I was like I was like who in their right mind would think of that? Like that is horrible. 
I feel like that was just to get some commotion out of the fan base, and Definitely. but no, it was like one of it was one of those like NHL rumor kind of accounts, and I was just like, why? Like what? If there was anyone I would trade for Patrick Line, you would have to throw in a pick, I would think. Yes, you would definitely you would have, have to throw in the first round. At least, pick. Uh, could you throw in two seconds? That's a possibility, but I would think Winnipeg would probably prefer the first round pick for a Patrick Line. Yeah, obviously he's one of their top, yeah, top players as of now going into his you third would, year. You would probably also have to give him either a or roster player. Year, excuse me. Or even like a high end prospect, and I'm not willing to give up a guy like Joel Faraby, Morgan Frost, Isaac Radcliffe. Yeah, I'm not willing to give I'm up not, any of those guys. No, no. But if, hey, what if Chuck Fletcher manages to fleece a Winnipeg for them and get Patrick Lani? But I doubt that's going to happen because Chuck Fletcher, we all know he's bad with money. Uh, the Devils, the Senators, there was a couple other teams that were in there as well. I think Montreal was one of them too. Yeah, Montreal. Montreal's been trying to get everyone, and that's I think that's because they were a team that struggled with uh, scoring goals this year too. Yeah, Max Domi was one of their best players, and having a guy like Jonathan Drewin, he yeah. was a top three pick, and he hasn't really lived up to the expectations. But uh, he wasn't that in, good with Tampa Bay. Yeah, he wasn't that good with Tampa Bay. He's got Montreal. They really didn't fit a role for him because they kept switching him from center to wing, the center to wing, back and forth, and he really just couldn't find that consistency. I and think it, one of the reasons why. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Uh, one fine. of the reasons that um, he was not that consistent with Tampa because that was when they had Alex Kalorn was still a good player. He's still a solid player. Tyler Johnson was a solid player back when Kucherov wasn't as good as he was. Now they had Andre Palat who's had better, who's uh, had real good years as well. So if Drew, I think if Drew was still on Tampa Bay, say they never did trade, uh, say Montreal still had Sergachev. Yes. Because uh, th- that was the trade, right? Drew and Sergachev. Yes. Yeah. So if they never did that trade, I think Drew and could definitely fit in with Tampa this year with the way they have Joseph, Sorelli, uh, all those guys on their on their uh, low, lower lines. I think Drew and could fit in fine. But I think at the time it was just because of uh, one, the line he was on. He was on what, third line? I think so. Yeah, third. He was around third, fourth. Um, I mean, I think that was only because of the guys they still had. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, Kalorn, Johnson, Kucherov, Palat. Um, but I definitely do think that if uh, if Druin can be a solid player uh, for Montreal this year, I th- I think they could definitely make the playoffs in the in the Atlantic too. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, Montreal was trying to go after everyone under the sun. Right. They offered Matthew Shane a contract. He didn't accept it with them. I'm sure they tried to go after Skinner, but no news has been on that. Wow. I feel like I they... he was definitely staying in Buffalo. Yeah, he was definitely staying at Buffalo. But I think Montreal was just trying to go after everyone. They offered each Sebastian Ajo, like we mentioned earlier. That didn't mm-hmm. succeed well for them. Wow. It's just like everything that Bergevin's trying to do something. Like you, you could tell he's trying to do something to make the team better. It's just right. not working out in his favor. Right. You got to feel bad for him because Montreal, they've been criticizing Bergevin a lot lately right. for not making the team better. But he, you could see he's putting his dedication to making these moves. And yeah. you got to give it to the guy right there. Yeah. And you got to give it to Chuck Fletcher. He's trying to make the Flyers a lot better team. And right. hopefully all these moves that he's making right now are going to pan out for this team. Because Let's hope. The city definitely needs the Flyers to be better. Because definitely. I need Flyers, them to be better. Yeah, we both I know you need, need them better. to be better. Definitely. Everyone and needs just, it to be better. I've been waiting too le- too long. Too long. It's just been since this stretch of mediocrity, the Flyers' relevancy in Philadelphia has been just dropping and dropping and dropping. You have the Eagles winning their Super Bowl a couple of years ago. They've been they're always gonna be the top of the Philadelphia sports fan list. Oh, it's a definitely. football city. The right. Sixers going through the process. Now you got guys like Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, you got Alpha Horford over to th- over the Summer and free agency, Josh Richardson. It's just all the NBA title hype with the 76ers, too. You have the Philadelphia Phillies, even though they're a very frustrating team. You got Bryce Harper, JT Romuto. Very exciting stuff with the team going down in the future. But there's just hasn't been that excitement with the Flyers just because mediocrity. Even though we have one of the better prospect pools in the league, it's just no one's really, ex- even though these prospects, they do come up and do good. There's not that explosive guy that just comes right out of the bat. We had Goss Spare that did that. 
and he's been very streaky, inconsistent over his tenure with the Flyers. But we haven't had that guy that comes out and just lights the lamp instantly. We just need something with this team to make the fan base excited again. We need to be a good team to bring back the fan base because that's desperately what we need because I desperately miss a sold-out Wells Fargo Center every single game. Because you could definitely see the attendance from last year to years previous, it's starting to dwindle. You're starting to see more patches in the seats. Mm-hmm. It's and just... the, the attendance did go out, and they said we were like fifth. I didn't believe that for I, anything. Me neither. I did not believe that there, whatsoever. No way. I was like, there's no way we were fifth in attendance for how bad they were. All I'm a season ticket holder. I go to every game. And all those patches I saw in those seats every single home game, we were not top five in attendance that I year went, whatsoever. Yeah, I went to around like five or six games. Uh, I mean, and I watched just about every game on TV. And trust me, there was not a lot of people in those seats. And I think the reason that they're trying to get more people in the seats is the giveaways as well. They did announce their... Uh, promotion schedule today. Um, they have a, gre- a gritty Chia Pet. Kind of uh, the same thing as the Jake Voracek one like last year. Um, they have the mystery t-shirt night on the home opener. They have a dollar dog night. Uh, there's that gritty kind of like magnet thing. Sticks to like the back of your car. I mean, there's a Couturier scarf. There's a lot of different things that they have been trying to, uh, I guess, bring into the team. Last year, they had the gritty t-shirt giveaway. Uh, there was a lot of stuff they gave out last year. Uh, they had 90s night. This year they got 80s night, uh, and that's against the LA Kings. Um, but I think another reason that they're trying to get more people to come is those renovations also that have been happening to Wells Fargo. Uh, that new scoreboard, you got the new seats, all the new clubs, the sports branding that you brought up. I mean, there's a lot of new things. And I also think that the Sixers have also taken a lot of Wells Fargo away from the Flyers because for a while that was all Flyers. Like, if you notice, like, I'm sure you go into the store, don't you? Yes. You notice how it uh, used to be all Flyers and there was mm-hmm. a little bit of Sixers? It's now starting to get more Sixers. I mean, there's still Flyers in there, don't get me wrong, but it started you, – you, I mean, you know what I mean. It's Yeah, it's start, starting it's, to It's become... picking away at – but if they can have a bounce back year this year, and if they can have consistent play, and they can can they can continue that in the next year, I think the fan base is going to come back. Yeah, if this team can show that they can be a good team this year, they can make some noise. You are going to bring the fan base back. Yeah, fans are going to want to come and see the new renovations with the Wells Fargo Center. That's oh, all yeah. great and dandy. That's all great and dandy. But and that the- can be for anyone. Yeah. That's going to be for anyone. Sixers, concerts, whatever. The most important no thing wings. is the product on the ice has to be watchable. Right. And last year we compared sometimes to maybe like a Division One hockey team, maybe a Pee Wee team. That's how <laughs> bad we played sometimes last year. I'm not lying. Yeah, that's, I know. That's what I compared <laughs> I, to I know. sometimes. And the team has to be watchable this year. They have to be consistent. They have to prove that they're a contender. You'll get the fan base back, back once you prove that you could do those things. And... Yeah, it's going to be a very exciting season coming up. I'm looking forward to training camp, the veteran camp starting this weekend. I'm looking forward to the rookie game tomorrow. And just looking forward to see what new faces can be make some noise with this roster. It's going to be a very exciting season. So, Chris, wrapping up this podcast, how do you feel right now? I'm very excited. Um, this is going to be a real good season for the Flyers. Um, I'm excited for a lot of different reasons. Um, uh, we got the prospects that we talked about. You got the new guys coming in. You got the new Wells Fargo Center. You got the game in Czech Republic. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. I'm really excited for this year, and it's going to be a good year. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. So, without further ado, it's about time that we wrapped up this first rendition of the Flyer Up Podcast. I'm your host, Amadeo Garcia, along with Chris Mayer. Thank you for listening to this podcast, and we'll hope we'll see you in the next podcast. See you, guys. Goodbye, everyone.